So, uh, Jennifer, uh, we're waiting for you to give us the cue. All righty. Well, I just wanted to wait just a few more moments okay. to allow a few more guests that are coming in. Uh, but I do want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we are really excited, you know, when when we began this journey so many years ago, we started with Cabernet Sauvignon and um, Brian has always done a really great job of uh, making wines that are age worthy and that can really hold up. And it's taken us a few years to get our library built up. And so now we, we do, and we can go back and, and try some of these older vintages. And so uh, not just the Cabernet Sauvignon, which we're gonna do tonight, but we have other, uh, other library wines where we have multiple vintages and we'll be able to look forward to doing these kinds of things um, in the future with some other varietals. So, but tonight it's Cabernet uh, all the way. Uh, 2013, 15, and 17. Uh, we're gonna go through. We're gonna we're gonna taste each uh, each vintage. Um, we'll start with the 13, then we'll go to the 15, and then the 17. In between, we'll pause, and you know we want to know we want to hear what you think. We want to hear what you smell, what you taste, what you like, uh, what you might be eating that goes well with it or doesn't go well with it. Um, so it's kind of fun for us to, to have that engagement. Um, and you guys all know how to unmute yourself when, when you're wanting to, to speak. And when you're not speaking, we'll ask you to mute just so that we minimize the background no noise. And I will do the same. Um, other than that, it's 7.04. And just to respect everybody who's on time, I think we should get started. Why not? All right, hey, uh, welcome everybody um, to our, our virtual vertical tasting with Bumgarno Winery. My name's Brian. I'm uh, the guy behind winesnob.blog and I'm a huge fan of Brian Bumgarner's wines here. Um, coordinating and managing the um, session is Jennifer Bumgarner, Brian's wife and, and partner and uh, I've been following his wines for well over a decade now and I've, I've been a huge fan of uh, the work he does with wines and um, I just love their structured, bold, age-worthy characters. Um, and it's been, uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure to follow his work all these years and follow the Bumgarners and watch them progress through um, that journey. Um, so with that being said, um, We'll hand it over. We're starting with the 2013. And, yes, uh, we are. We're starting with 13 and <clears throat> just to kind of set it up a little bit. We are dealing with El Dorado mountain grown cabs and across the board, these are from um, high elevation, well-drained soils, uh, lots of UV. One of the things I uh, really love about Cabernet in El Dorado is that it has a long, long hang time because with the high elevation, you can, you can hang those out there until late October, sometimes early November, and really get nice concentration and the acidity is well retained because it is so cool in there. Um, as I said, we're dealing with three different, vin uh, different vineyards um, in addition to three different vine vintages. We have uh, fruit coming from the uh, Sierra Vista vineyard uh, in the 13, and in the 15 we're at Duarte Vineyard up in Georgetown. So Sierra Vista is down in the lower part of the county in kind of mid El Dorado. And that's high elevation, about 2,800 foot, right up on the ridge top. Uh, old vine Cabernet, probably planted in the late 70s. Sierra Vista is one of the pioneers up in our area. And I wanted to work with his fruit. So in the 13, I, I'm working with that. And then the Duarte Vineyard is has been my primary vineyard since I started in 2005. Um, with two exceptions, the 13 and the 17. Those are the only two years I didn't make um, Duarte Vineyard fruit. And we'll get into the reasons why. Um, and then lastly, we'll be pouring the 17, and that comes from a, another high elevation vineyard, Grace Vineyards, uh, in Camino, which is at about 3,000 feet. So while we're on the topic of the 13, um, this is a, I believe, a small blend. In the 13, we have uh, about 12% Malbec blended in with the cab. Um, the Malbec comes from a vineyard in Camino, 
and um, that just kind of lends some uh, dark, large dark berries, some grip, uh, yeah. nice tannins on the Malbec. But uh, did you did you find um, is that some is that uh, something you would do maybe to because they have a lot the fruit has a lot of hang time so you get these very intense fruit expression um, is that is that is that one way to perhaps balance to that accentuate out? that or yeah. balance it out uh, and I would say yes um, each vintage I approach you know um, kind of as you know as a standalone and make those decisions just prior to bottling okay so I'm often you know pulling in different blenders and then I'll do you know controlled blends and um, I felt that this vintage just benefited with that little extra punch of the Malbec. Yeah, you can't beat a little Malbec there. Yeah. That good, rich, monolithic structure you get. Right. It's almost like throwing in a little Cab Franc. Yeah, yeah, it gives that mid palate. Yeah. Just makes it pop a little bit. Especially with the fruit up, you know, in the foothills there, it's just so rich and so intense. The berries, right. the plum, especially with Cab. Um, you almost need, you almost can't let the cab stand by on its own. It, I usually will blend, you know, up to 15% or so, and it just is on a case-by-case -case basis, just finding that optimal balance, yeah. something that I, I feel is going to be age-worthy, something that I feel is going to be um, just, just more uh, representative of the, the palette I'm looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a nice full palette. Um, so, on the nose, I just love how poised and how relaxed it is. It's, right. Um, and, you know, one thing I always look for is, you know, um, I like how you use that expression with the sense of place. Mm -hmm. I like, there's certain, depending on what region, there's certain things I've come to expect to see in a, fa in a faithful wine. And I just love that star anise that comes up up front. Mm -hmm. and, it's so unmistakable, and a little bit of that granite in the back. It's so um, uh, typical of this region. And, and for me, that sort of sets the stage when I'm tasting a wine, is certain key characteristics right. that are unmistakable of that region. It's also interesting in, in looking at the vineyard comparison is that we're dealing with pretty different soil types in that Pleasant Valley. Uh, area we have more of a granitic decomposed granite yeah. soil whereas in the northern part of the county into that Camino Ridge and up in Georgetown you have that rich volcanic loamy red dirt yeah uh, so that kind of is, a, is another factor that brings in and uh, will express more of that you know terroir yeah I love that I think this 13 has had had some really good time to relax. It's still really firm. Yeah, there's still some tension yeah. on, right on the attack there. So I get, I get cherries on the nose. Does anybody else? Some cherry? I get dark cherries, yeah. yeah. Dark cherries for sure. Dark cherries for sure. Uh, dark plum. I, I was also expressing, um, <clears throat> when, I, when I do text sheets, um, this was written probably in 2016. So as the wine evolves, some of those things will come forward. I noticed that I wrote black cherry. It, I'll just read it. It says, this, this Cabernet displays strength and balance. Harmoniously shows ripe fruit and subtle spices. It's full bodied with firm tannins. It is smooth on the palate with a long finish. Uh, this wine layers in notes of black cherry, cassis, uh, got some espresso bean, dark chocolate notes on the finish. And those, you know, those characteristics will kind of evolve as that wine ages. Certain things will come out. Maybe the fruit drops back a little bit. You might get some of those more secondary, uh, terroir-driven notes. Um, oak might come out a little bit more yeah. as the wine ages. Yeah, I think as it opens, I can't remember what vintage it was I looked at. Um, as it opened up about two hours later, um, just decanting um, a lot more of the the, the oak, mm -hmm. and and I, I don't know if this is the the exact process, but it, it felt like those rich tannins, some of them were oxidizing. There's 
it was adding to this caramel essence mm -hmm. in the wine, especially on the finish, yeah. where, where you would typically encounter those big, you know, that bold tannic grip by itself. Um, it definitely developed more of this um, caramel type of exp caramelized right. expression. Um, one thing I like about the 13 is that, you know, as, as we talked about up the hill there, the, you get this intense fruit expression which tend to make these very big wines. And, but if you give them enough time, those sort of mellow out, integrate a little more, break down, you know, a little bit more and allow the terroir to kind of shine through. Yeah. Allow some of that wet wood to, to sit and kind of compete with the granite and you know, the star anise. And I just love that. Mm -hmm. Although it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to find wines because the wines are in such small batches. And so few folks, had, there's rarely enough for a library. Right. And so, Unless you sell it yourself, <laughs> right. looking for that, you might be disappointed. <laughs> Which is why I keep, I maintain the cellars because I want to cellar these wines because, you know, it's like this one is, you know, 244 cases. Right. Yeah. It's, there's not enough to store and do and revisit this 10 years down the road. Well, and that's, that's one of the reasons um, Jennifer and I started uh, a library, putting aside, you know, 20, 30, 40 cases of each vintage, just so that we'd have the opportunity to do these kind of in retrospective, yeah. look back, see where the wines are and, and where they're going. You know, I can, I can see, I can now pick up that um, the oak. It's 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 unobtrusive. It's not too much, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it kind of it's it's fairly restrained, but it's definitely French oak. Yeah. You have this very refined. It's like a very clean, refined sugar, like mm -hmm. caramel. Yeah. Um, as opposed to say a buttery. Um, thick, kind of almost more butterscotch. Caramelly. Yeah, more caramelly um, oak. I think I think this this thirteen is perfect right now. It is drinking really nice. Yeah. I would say um, still has some still has some life in it, but uh, yeah, I don't think this would disappoint. I have a yeah. question. Yes. So how much longer can this 2013 lay? Well, just based on, on historicals, um, most of my cabs are good for 10, 15 years. Um, and I'm, I'm still drinking a little of the 05, which is my first vintage. So do you, you had a bottle of that recently, didn't yes. you? Yes. Yeah, we opened yeah. Uh, yeah, we opened an 05. It was a Merlot. Right. And, um, <laughs> and an 08. And yeah, the, the 05 Merlot finally relaxed. I had been tracking, I'd been tracking it all these years and got down to my last bottle we opened uh, you know, a couple months ago. That was fun. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. That, that segment will be coming out. I, I recorded the whole segment, but uh, the 05 up until about a year or so ago, you know, came out swinging. Um, the 08 was just still, just had a lot of life left in it. So mm -hmm. I think they age very gracefully. Um, his wines typically age very gracefully. They're, they have good structure, good tension. There's some good acidity and good tannins in there. A lot of tannins typically is what I've known his wines um, to have. So they definitely need time to relax. Um, I would say, you know, even the, seven, the 17 um, is just barely approachable right so so a lot of a lot of the um, the ageability of the cab is kind of dictated by when it's picked and how it is um, vinified if you if you're getting a wine up to 24 25 bricks um, with decent acidity those wines will probably be 14.5 alcohol um, with a pH of three and a half, 3.6 at the most. I, I try and keep my pHs in, in control uh, because I want that longevity. Um, I would say there's, there's a whole different school of thought. A lot of people want to put wines out that are drinkable right now. And a lot of foothill cabs in particular um, often will be uh, 
very approachable. Uh, maybe they're doing more fining. These are, these are aged about three years. Most of these, I believe, are about 36 months in the barrel. And bottled without fining or filtration. So they are, they're, they're, they're just built for that. They're built for age. Um, I, I try and avoid being overly fruit forward because I think the varietal character can get lost sometimes. If you have a wine that is just all jammy and fruit forward and high alcohol sometimes, those wines just aren't ageable. They'll fall apart pretty quickly. Yeah, I agree. I think um, <laughs> it's funny. I going up, hanging out in the foothills a lot. Um, definitely been no stranger to very fruit forward uh, wines. And as I've come to learn, you know, it's this long ripening season, and so it, it's more of a trying to wrestle all that fruit and all the sugars and whatnot. Um, but one of the things that stood out the first time I ever tried one of your wines was. They were dry. <laughs> um, Sorry. I did meet the phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, this is your show. So. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I did um, meet my phone. So yeah, one of the, 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 the first, the things that really stood out with your wine and really captured me were they were dry. Right. And they had nice big bold tannins, and good structure, and, and they're fairly delineated. And so what that told me was they had some good longevity. Right. And they still had a lot more integration to do in the bottle. And I like that because I want to be able to follow the wine. When I buy my wines, when I seek wines out, I don't necessarily seek wines for now. Mm -hmm. It's wines that I can sort of follow over time and just enjoy the progression. Yeah. That, that was kind of my interest as well. I. I worked for another winery that had been making wines since the early 70s uh, with all the rabbit grapes. And many of you will know which winery that was. Yeah. Um, but that was so inspirational to, to be able to see wines that were 10, 15, 20 years old and still very structured, very ageable, and still delivering on, on flavor. So that, that kind of informed my decision and my approach to making Cabernet. Yeah. Um, so I know we answered your question in a very roundabout way. I think um, I th for me, uh, just for me personally, with my 13s, I have, I think um, I'm going to enjoy them and revisit them uh, probably on the blog over the next three to five years. Um, you know, on the finish, there's still there's still some grip there, especially once it decants, which is kind of interesting. Most wines, as you decant them, they may soften a little bit. Mm -hmm. The 13 actually out the bottle, it feels a little relaxed and and, and and a little aged. But once it decants, you get that grip really comes through yeah. and it starts kind of coming back to life, so to speak. Um, so that means there's still, that tells me there's still some longevity left in it. Um. So does anybody else have any questions on the 13 or any um, observations as far as pairings or what you might be enjoying that with tonight? Oh yeah. Um, any pairings? Anyone doing any pairings tonight? <laughs> well, we actually are uh, trying a um a tart with mushrooms and then a um, like a cream cheese type thing, and I put it in the oven. It's like a flatbread, really good with it. Sounds great. Yeah. And to me, I feel I taste a little bit of bell pepper. I mean, it's like a like a little spice to it, so it's peppery. But I I, I kind of taste some pep bell pepper. Maybe I'm mm -hmm. wrong, but you know that's kind of on my palate. No, so. that is varietal. Um, definitely uh, Cabernet. Cab Franc, some of those varietals will exhibit Merlot sometimes, yeah. will exhibit those green characters and they'll usually come, come out more and show more in cooler vintages. Um, I don't recall particularly the 13, but um, also some of that is a function of hang time. Uh, if you let the wine ripen a little more, um, you can minimize some of that. Also clone dependent. There's a lot of different clones. Some of them tend to be more herbaceous, 
than others, and you might get more of those characteristics. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming, based on my knowledge of early Cabernet plantings in the foothills, this is probably the Jackson clone. Our estate vineyard was planted to the Jackson clone about the same time, around 1978. That was pretty commonly available. Um, the next wine is three different clones and some, some uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into it, but um, that could be a function uh, as well as the clone as well as, you know, when it was picked. Now for your, uh, for your cream cheese, I think it's going to pair even better as we go further up the vintages. Yeah. You're going to get a lot bolder acidity, a lot more, you know, a lot of tighter expression there. And that's going to contrast very nicely with your cream cheese. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I forgot to mention this. Um, sorry for the delay, I know some of you were asking. But I, um, at the last minute we managed to get the tech sheets up. So you can find them <laughs> at uh, winesnob.blog slash tech dash sheets. And um, Jennifer, if you can post that in the chat as well. So it's winesnob.blog slash tech dash sheets and you should go through um, follow with these tech sheets as well I'll also post um, the tech sheets I'll do a post about this uh, tasting later on uh, that's why we're recording so um, your views won't be published um, in case you're <laughs> in case you're concerned it would be us so I have other cameras on us here so we'll have a segment um, your audio may and questions may be included in that, but not your video. So, um, with that being said, um, you ready to move on to the 15? Yes, I All am. All right. <laughs> good. Yes. yes. Which brand? <laughs> no, forward slash tech. Dash sheets. Yeah. You're welcome. We both answered a brand. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it always it always catches me off guard when I'm at the at the winery and you know, it's be Jennifer kind of yeah. Brian? <laughs> oh no, sure. not me. <laughs> mm. Alright, so we're going on to the 2015. 2015 is Duarte fruit. So this is the only Duarte um, vineyard represented in this tasting. Duarte vineyard is, is kind of unique. Um, I've talked about it in many of my other virtuals that we did during the pandemic, but Duarte is a unique vineyard, probably one of the most profitable vineyards in California uh, because they're growing that entire vineyard uh, for Budwood as well as selling the fruit. It's a 200, I believe, maybe even 250 acre vineyard. It's very remote and they pick that location not just for the elevation but also because there's no other vineyards near it. It's on a ridge top surrounded by rivers and um, they want clean Budwood. So they are, uh, Duarte is involved in the nursery business, selling wine grapes to the wine industry. It's the largest grapevine nursery in California. And the primary purpose of that vineyard was to have a Budwood harvest for each of these different clones. As a winemaker, it's a pretty unique vineyard and I, that's what really attracted me to it. In that I could go there and get any clone of Cabernet that's commercially available in their catalog I could get the blenders, different clones of Petit Verdot, different clones of Malbec, different clones of Merlot, Cap Franc, all from the same vineyard. And so I started doing that in 2005. And we made nothing but Cabernet in 2005, 6, and 7. And then so right about that time we started thinking, hmm, how are we going to sell all this wine? <laughs> no, actually 2008 had had come into play at that point too and a lot of the restaurant accounts I was targeting as potential clients uh, closed up doors and um, we started looking to open the tasting room and so I, I bought Tempranillo from Duarte, I bought Pinot Noir from Duarte and Petite Syrah and 
they, they have quite an array of different grapevines that they're growing there. They're selling all those grapevines, uh, selling the grapes and then building grapevines and selling those from Duarte Nurseries. And um, this particular cab is 100% Cabernet, but it's made from three different Cabernet clones. And the clones represented in this particular one, I don't know if they're listed on the sheet, but I know there's 337 and clone uh, six and clone uh, clone four. Uh, as I mentioned, different clones have different characteristics. They're all, genetically, they're the same material, but they've kind of evolved and been selected for unique properties that they have. Um, some of those are old Napa clones. Uh, the 337 is a California clone that's just all big cherry pie. It's really fruit forward. Um, the clone four kind of brings in kind of that dusty Rutherford dust, you know, characteristic. I can pick that up, yeah, um, on the finish. Yeah, so 100% cab, Duarte fruit. I, I get more oak on the nose on this one. Yeah. Lots of bright, bright cherry fruit. It's not as thick, it's a little brighter. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's a little more, um, for lack of a better term, kind of perky. Yeah, Very, a little more fruit forward. Yeah. So these are all, uh, I'll just go into the process a little bit. They're all made very similarly. I do bin fermentation primarily on, on most of my cabs, so they're getting lots of good skin contact. They get punched down about three times a day, um, usually starting with a cold soak. Cold soak is where I get all of my color. Um, and then I have really a better sense of the chemistry of the wine as the wines sit on the juice. Um, you have things being pulled out of the, the skins, yeah, not only color, but you're also getting potassium pulled out of the skin. So at the crusher, you might have a pH of 3.5 after a two or three day cold soak. That could rise 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. Uh, it can because the potassium is being pulled out of the skins, and so you can really have a better sense of your chemistry after a cold soak than uh, any other way. Also, there might be you know proportion of those grapes that are raisins, and the bricks might need to be adjusted slightly. Um, that being said, um, fermentations are generally fairly cool. I try and get those cold soaks in around 50 degrees. And then very gradually after I inoculate the wines after three days on the skins, those temperatures will start to rise as you get thermal inertia from, from the fermentation going. And with three punch downs a day, you're getting uh, release of that heat. You're integrating those skins, which might be cooler because they're in a cool room. You stir that back in and cool that juice down. Fermentation usually 10 to 14 days, depending on various uh, things, but those wines would be pressed then, um, settled out in tank, and then go to barrel. And after probably five to six rackings, those wines, uh, 36 months later, are blended together, and, and any blending decisions would be made at that point, and then we go to, go to the bottle. So, speaking of rackings, I was, I was, I've been wanting, one of the things I've been wanting to uh, sort of get, you know, get your take on, your process is um, is precisely that. I guess uh, elevage is what they call it. Um, how? Um, what's your general strategy as far as that's concerned? Um, I, I see. Obviously, you 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 do fewer rackings than I've seen. I've seen people do five times that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there's there's toppings, and that that's keeping the wine off, you know, the yeah, oxygen yeah. and so forth. But you know, there's there's gross lees which you're removing uh, most of that in tank. Like, so after pressing, you settle that out, you get rid of most of the gross leaves, and then you're, you're having more fine leaves, you know, through malactic fermentation, there's more leaves, and gotcha. the wines are pretty well clarified after the first year in the barrel. And it's, you know, you might lose some color and you have some cold stabilization happening where um, those, the potassium yeah. and 
tartaric acid are binding up and sticking to the sides of the barrels. Yeah. Um, malolactic is happening, and you have uh, the development of those characteristics, and those wines become um, more stable after that, and they don't change a whole lot. Um, after, once the ML is done, that's usually in the first couple months. Is, is there any reason why you don't wreck more than you do? Um, or you don't wreck less? But I know it's already you're wrecking pretty infrequently already as it is. So. Yeah, so the, the wines will be racked at least twice a year. Okay. And you know, that usually ends up being at least six rackings post, um, post uh, gross lease. And that's really all, it's all it needs. Um, after two or three years in the barrel, those wines are very clean. I mean, I've, I've tested them with NTU meter in there as if they had been filtered practically. Well, there's also very, very the clean. risk with every racking, right, of introducing something, so, yeah. I, you also, anytime you're racking, you, you are picking up some oxygen. You're interfering. With yeah, if you want, if you want to keep the wines for a long term, you, you want to, yeah. Leave them them. yeah, let them settle. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I just, I'm just, it's just something in the back of mind as I encounter different winemakers or different, you know, sellers, and I look at their process. So again, this uh, protocol is depending on the wine. This, this is a wine that's going to sit for three years in the barrel. If I wanted to get that wine out in 12 to 18 months, I might be racking it monthly. You know, yeah. that would be a different, that'd be a different protocol. To that approach. makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I can correlate that now. You know, some. A lot of the instances have been, it's wine that's being prepped for right. a more uh, immediate release. Yep. So, let's talk about those clones. Is, is there, you know, maybe I'm sinking too, too much into it. Say this year, 2015, you're going, you're looking, you have certain, you had certain key vineyards that are, you know, um, yielding the fruit that you like and that you, you seek out to make your wines when you, you show up. Do you, are you thinking down to the clone level or? To, to some degree, and it's also just favorites, ones that you've worked with that worked out really well. And so I've got my, my favorite little Cabernet clones that I like to work with. Um, but it's also what's available, you know. Um, I usually have a conversation with a grower and what what is looking really well and I'll frequently go up there walk the vineyard taste the clones and that that is a big big part of it um, you can make wine by numbers you know, your grower says hey it's 24 bricks it's ready let's pull it um, I've never been a fan of that I like to get out there I like to taste I like to take my own samples back to the lab work with it um, and make those decisions at that point Trust and I might, very fun. I might pull a bunch of different samples of a bunch of different clones and taste the fruit, walk the vineyard, and, and you have a better idea of what you're working with. Um, do you, is, is so a blend like this of these different clones, is it like a field blend of the clones or do you make the, each clone separately? They're usually picked separately and they arrive separately. Okay. And I make, I usually will, um, I usually ferment them together. Mm. Uh, okay. Different varietals, obviously, I'll, I'll be fermenting differently. But um, if I'm getting a, I'm getting a field blend, so to speak. They yeah. come in different bins, yeah. but I'm fermenting them together. Together, yes. And some of that is just practicality. Um, does does your walking the vineyard affect your final field blend that you do? It can. Okay. You know, it, based on what I'm tasting, I, I would say you know, pick these. I'd, I'd prefer two tons of that, one ton of this. And, that type of thing. I've always thought, I'm always fascinated with field blends because it's the ultimate commitment. <laughs> you can't walk anything back. No, you can't. You can't no, you create, can't. you know, not necessarily just at the clone level, but even sometimes if you're looking at Bordeaux blend or, mm -hmm. you know, just any other blend, Tuscan blend or any of the popular blends, once you commit those grapes into fermentation, right. that's it. There's no walking it back. This is true. You know, it, it is a, it's a leap of faith. But a lot of winemaking is. True. So um, I, I just enjoy um, having a lot of options because that really one of my favorite parts of winemaking is, is crafting a blend. And so like 
with our Bordeaux blend, the Meritage blend, all of those varietals, five different Bordeaux varietals, all blended or identified separately and blended upon bottling. Like this bottle. I love blending. Me too. It's, it's, it's the best. It's, it's like cooking. Yes. <laughs> This Anyone have any comments on the 15? I think um, as you taste these, you know, keep in mind that they're coming from different vineyards. Um, the blends are slightly different. This is a newer wine, it's a younger wine, it's showing more fruit. Um, it's, definitely, it's definitely a little tighter, um, there's, there's a lot more tension. Um, a lot more spice on the back there. The finish is definitely um, bolder. Mm -hmm. um, has a long, um, lingering uh, finish. Drier palate. My lips are sticking to my teeth. <laughs> Job hazard. I love it. <laughs> I, love it. I, I love my wines that demand all of my attention. That's right. But I know that's not for everybody and you know, Thanks to Wine Snob, I constantly have to, you know, think outside my own box and, and you know, stay open-minded. But yeah, this is, um, I, I like it. Uh, this definitely is in the early, and it's still in its first half right. of its life. I think, you know, 2015, you know, we're at, you know, seven years-ish. So I think it has easily until Ten would be a ten-year mark would be a good I think so. point to start looking at this. So that would put us at 2025. It would be a good time to really pull this out. It would be a little more integrated. It would be a slightly um, less firm. And that would give a lot more of those terroir notes to start shining through. They, they have to compete less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and as it decants, you know, it would it would definitely open up. This, yeah, I think open a decant a couple hours in. Um, you'll probably start getting a little glimpse of what it's going to be like down yeah. the road. Um, it has very nice bright fruit on the front compared to the 20, uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. Yeah. Usually cabs come with this heavy, weighty fruit expression. It's yeah. very thick. The, the 13 has more of that, but this, um, the fruit's a little more crisp, a little yes. brighter. Jen, do you have any comments on that one? Anyone else? Yeah. Well, I was going to say that when I first, so I poured my wines about 40 minutes before the tasting, I poured them in my glass. And uh, by the time I came around to, to the 15, um, I got a lot of sweet pepper on the nose, much more than um, I did on the 13. Not like green bell, but yeah. It was a little sweeter than, than a green, but yeah, I mean, it was kind of some green, a little green, but a little more sweetness than, than typical green bell, in, in, just in my opinion. And then um, I decided to top it up and it was different, the, the, the fresh pour versus what had sat open. And so mm -hmm. the, the fresh pour I got, it was a little bit more tight. I got much more of the tannins and everything. So I think that there really is something to letting it set and breathe and open up. And, and I would encourage, um, I don't know how many people had the opportunity to have multiple glasses, um, but going, if you are, to yeah, if you go can back compare the two. Yeah, yeah. In, in the tasting after it sits about a bit and we get through the third wine, going back to the first and giving that a try, it's kind of fun. Yeah, so definitely. Fun. Yeah, and, and I always say wine is a living beverage and it interacts with it's the environment with, with the oxygen in the glass, with, with you, with your mood, uh, with what you're having with it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely one of the many things I love about wine is that it's, it's variable and it's like a good friend. Yeah. Anyone else have any comments on the 15? <laughs> Lily's iPad, lots of thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> I think 15 overall was a really great vintage. And so it, it'll be exciting to see this, you know, mellow. I think it even has more grip than the 13 in the, in the, in the um, finish, so. Absolutely, I can see the 15 having even more longevity than the 13. 
because it's only we're only talking two years difference. Right. And the 13 feels much further along than the 15. More developed. The 15 still feels like it's still developing. Mm -hmm. it, it hasn't even hit its stride yet. Um, one thing I also like is um, the way the way the various different blends are complementing itself. I think it's going to have a, a much um, a much uh, more uh, how do you put it for lack of a better term, a crisp, classy, benchmark type of expression. Yeah. Um, it's gonna have a, a more of a quintessential expression. All right, Brian, we wanna hear from Lily. She's got, they've yep. got their hand up. Yeah. Um, hi, I have a quick question, and I, you might have said this, but we've got little kids running around the house. Sorry about that. Um, no. Are these the same grapes that were in the 2013, or the same type of grapes, even the like so, human amount of the so cab, this one is a hundred percent cab. This mm. one's a hundred percent cab from the Duarte Vineyard. The thirteen was a blend of eighty-eight uh, percent cab and twelve percent Malbec. So slightly different. I did add a little bit of Malbec in the thirteen. And is the thir thirteen is a different vineyard? Then? And it is a different vineyard. Yes. So all three of these cabs are from different vineyards. The thirteen is from the Sierra Vista Vineyard. The fifteen is from uh, Duarte Vineyard in Georgetown. So it's in the northern part of El Dorado. And then we have the final uh, seventeen would be from the Grace Vineyard in Camino. So we're still in El Dorado. Yep. But. You're All the looking, is very diverse. Yes, it's, yeah. it's, it's it's sort of this lengthy, slender AVA. Yep. Um, uh, but you get a good sense between all three of them. So a lot of the char any characteristics you find in common with all three of them are you can you can pretty much assume that those are typical of the AVA. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna pick up that dusty granitic expression on the on the in the body and on the finish there you're gonna pick up that star anise that's very typical of it it's kind of like a black licorice it's very faint sometimes, sometimes you know sometimes they call it fennel yeah. fennel yes yeah yeah, yeah. similar yeah um, so you're gonna you're gonna pick up those characteristics those are very typical of this AVA and this region you're also gonna pick up more intense fruit compared to other regions mm -hmm. cab from other regions even Napa even you know, Sonoma or any, you know, Central Coast, you won't find that rich, ripe plum and yeah. dark cherries and just that very intense berry expression. And sometimes it's even on the nose because the wine may be dry, but you still get that intense flavor of the fruit. So those are, this is a good opportunity to kind of not only go up and down, explore um, three different vin uh, vintages, but also three distinct, the characteristics of yeah, three different vineyards. Three different vineyards, and what they share in common is unique, is iconic to that region, um, and what they share in common is may also be, or what they share individually is can be attributed to more of the winemaking process. Right. Yep. Is there anyone else that has any comments on this guy, or any other pairing suggestions? Well, I think we can get on to the 2017 then. Yes, absolutely. So the 2017 has a blend as well, much like the 2013. The 2017 has some Malbec. It's 86% Cab with 7% Malbec and 7% Petit Verdot. So those both of those varietals add a bunch of heft. They add tannin, they add a lot of color. Um, just looking at this wine, it's, it's got some really nice color. Yeah. Um, it's very intense. This comes from the Grace Vineyard, which is in Camino. It has those deep volcanic loamy soils, um, but they're also very well drained. It's, uh, it's a beautiful vineyard. If you've been through Apple Hill, you drive right by it. Uh, 
great spinners make some excellent caps as well. Uh, 2017. 2017 is kind of right at the tail end of the drought too. Uh, yeah. Pretty intense fruit from that vintage. What was your comment? I was just saying right on the nose immediately. Um, it's you can almost miss it, but it's a very subtle butterscotch. It just okay. kind of hits yeah. the nose. It's a flash. It's a, there's more viscosity to this wine. Yes. It's a lot bigger on the palate. Yeah. The tannins are also more integrated, less delineated. Yeah. With the 15, you could tell, you could sort of feel the boundary between the tannins and the body. Right. This is more of like a really fine grain dust that's fully dissolved or suspended mm -hmm. within the body. It's really interesting. And it kind of leaves this chewy, almost, yeah, viscosity yeah. on the palate, um, on the finish as well. I think this is, even the 17 is even further along than the 15. As far as just poise, mm -hmm. maturity, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Yeah, it is. What did you do different? with the 17 versus the 15 did, if anything. Um, so I, as far as the winemaking, it's very, very, very similar. Um, so, so we're looking we're, so we're looking at just the fruit, that vintage, that harvest. This one um, had a slightly shorter barrel. Okay. Yeah, I think this one was about 24 months instead of 36. I've seen that before where, you know, some vintages uh, age much more graceful, much slower mm -hmm. than others. And yeah. others are just showing just amazing right up, you know, right. right up front. The 15, for what it is, I can't ima imagine what it was like two years ago. Yeah. Uh, it, it must have been really powerful. Right. And this is, you know, it's still on, you know, definitely, you know, the beginning there, but it's just interesting. So when, one of the, um well, the difference is I obviously said 24 months instead of 36, and that's a substantial mm -hmm. difference in time. Um, but there are a couple of reasons for that, and one of them is um, sell through. We did not have a 14 vintage. Well, no, we did have a 14 vintage of cab. We did not have a 16 vintage of cab. So I felt. Um, I felt I needed to get another cab in the bottle. Oh, okay. Because we skipped a vintage. We had the 15, and then 16, if you recall, we had the Forest Hill Fire. That's right. Forest Hill is right next to Georgetown. It's across the ridge. It was literally, um, you know, two miles away. And we talked, we touched about this on our last uh, segment we did, um, that that's the new reality now. You go through an entire year yeah. trimming, you know, catering, tending to the vineyards and, and literally fire season starts just right before harvest. Yeah. And, and, and earlier and earlier know. it seems. And earlier and earlier and later and later as well. And you, you just never know what's going, what's going to happen. And I remember in 16, the Forest Hill fire was just really devastating. It was, yeah. Um, I think prior to Caldor, I think Forest Hill was definitely right up there. For our area, it was, you know, it wasn't in El Dorado County, but it was on our border. And it was very, very impactful. A lot of growers uh, either skipped the vintage and or, you know, had issues. I remember, I remember holding my breath last harvest. Yeah, I did a lot of that too. I was right there, right the day before they evacuated, and it came right That's right, right. we came, were having dinner at the winery. Yeah, and it came right up to the estate, and I, I was supposed to come back the next day to shoot right. a segment with you. Right. And, yeah. We were smelling smoke at the end of that night. We were like, what is that? It smells like somebody's burning, and this is not burn season. Well, it's not permissible for yeah. season. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was scary. I also have, um, there'll be a segment coming out from my chat with him, and it was really nice to go on the quad and just look at just what was left from the Caldor fire. Right. And 
So, for those of you that don't know, the fire came within 50 yards of our property line, and my neighbors, um, most of their properties were impacted. Um, my neighbors to the north are right on Vineyard View Drive, which is our address, and the fires literally came right up to their back gates, all the way up to Canyon Wall. Cal, Cal Fire did an amazing job in our neighborhood. Um, they had time to prepare dozer lines and they set a, a back burn and saved every structure on Slug Gulch and our area of the fire was spared. Um, that being said, yeah, a lot of wineries were impacted. Yeah. Um, namely, I mean, all of our Fair Play wineries, many of us had smoke taint issues. Um, I was spared a lot of that because I, I didn't pick our Cabernet Sauvignon. We have five acres of Cabernet Sauvignon, but we were in process of um, changing our trellising. We had old quadrilateral trellising, and I chainsawed the entire vineyard, <laughs> pushed new wood, and we're, we're changing it to cane ferning. And so it was a, it was a by year anyway. We just yeah. were not going to pick that year. Um, the whites were largely spared because we picked them much earlier. They're picked. 21, 22 bricks, and so they had very minimal smoke exposure. So we were very fortunate. Yeah, I'm glad you know we made it through that. Um, I don't know what I would, have, I don't know where I would have gone for wine. <laughs> um. <laughs> but yeah, um, what do you think of all three of them? I know it's kind of like asking you to you know, choose your favorite child, but... <laughs> well, I have five kids and I get asked that a lot. Who's your favorite dad? No, no they never asked me that. But um, it is it is difficult. Um, I love them all for different reasons, right? No. Um, there's not, there's when not we were a at total brat in this group. Last you know? Saturday when we were at the winery, I remember uh, one of our friends was asking me, you know, so what's, what's your favorite? And I just, I, I started going, well, you know, I like the Fiona, yeah. but you know, it's a GSM, it's a GSM blend, and um, and I just like how mature and just well built and structured it is. Um, and then I started thinking, I was like, no, oh, but the Cab Franc is wow. Oh, but the Many Hands, the Bordeaux blend. Yeah. And I just kept going down and down and down and. Just, Alicante. <laughs> the, oh, the Alicante <laughs> Boucher. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I don't think I've given that one a fair shake because we've always opened it during an event. So right. I've never been able to give it a good focus look. Yeah, you have to, I'll, I'll set aside a bottle for you. I've only got a couple of cases left. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I, need, to, yeah. I need to get my hand on a couple of those. <laughs> sure. um, any thoughts on the 17? Does anyone have any favorites of the three? Yes. So I have to, um, 2013, but um, the 2017 is probably my favorite. And I didn't have anything to eat with it, to pair. <clears throat> Sorry. But I, th I think the 17, I like a pepper at the yep. finish. It was very smooth when I first started and I tasted it. And then it has a very good bite, like a good mm -hmm. pepper at the end. And I like yeah. that. It's very it's delicious. Good. All of them were delicious, but the 2017 is really good. It's definitely poised. I agree, yeah. <laughs> And, and surprisingly for a 17, especially for his wines, <laughs> usually it take much longer to, to be this poised. You know, the, the 15 is probably a, a, a closer analog to his style that I've kind of observed all these years. Uh, it's still kicking and it's going mm -hmm. to be kicking for a long time. Right. Um, I would say of the three, um, the 13s start opening them and the 17s, you know, following after that, not long after that, and the 15s, those need, those need some time, some cellar time. Anybody else? Is that, is that Samantha I see? Roland? <laughs> hey, it's Jeremy, where's Jeremy? Is he back? He had, he 
had softball tonight, but he's on his way like right now. So I know he's hoping to make like the end of it. I'm, I'm Jeremy tonight. Yeah, this is, this is Jeremy. <laughs> um, but I do like the vanilla taste at the very back of the wine. It's, it's, I, it's delicious. Which, uh, uh, what, what vintage? 17? Uh, we have yes. the 17. Yes, we're caught up yep. with ever. Okay. Yeah. Do you, is that not vanilla? I taste vanilla. No, it, it, no. It, that's, that's really common on the finish. Um, you, you get more fruit up front, and then as as you swallow the wine, a lot. I'm sorry? You taste it as well? Yes. Yeah, and that's it's really something that you find on the finish of a lot of these wines. And that is after the fruit has, you know, kind of gone through your oral cavity and and you're, you're left with that finish, which yeah. is more oak derived. Yeah. That vanilla from the French oak. Hey, Roland, Osmer. How you guys doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to put him on the spot. You're trying to get him. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mind me, I'll catch hey, you. Oh, hey. <laughs> there you are. No, well, we, we had a group of people that have different, different, uh, different uh, palates and different experiences with length of time that they, they've they been tasting wine. Yep. And so the majority of the newer folks like the 17, mm -hmm. where I like the 13 the best. It I can see that. It's a little more mellow and I that, that's the one I like better. Yeah. I think one of the things that the 13 benefits from is you get a lot of those big aggressive characteristics from the foothills, which are very typical, they've had time to mellow out right. and allow you to pick out much more. So if I, I can see the 13 for me is um, a more interesting sip. You get a lot of the secondary time. and tertiary yes. flavors and aromas yeah. from the 13. Yeah. Because that fruit's dropped back a little bit more. And it's just a personal preference. There's mm -hmm. no. Absolutely, there's yeah. No. Totally personal preference. But I think. Yeah, if I was getting together, you know, with some friends, I think the 17 would probably be the good middle road mm -hmm. um, for everybody. Um, yeah, I'm glad, uh, Roland, I'm glad you guys could join us and Samantha and company and I, I, I can't see everyone else there. Um, the computer is like way out there, so I can't see all the small screens, but um, I, I'm glad because I, I really wanted, um, you know, to share with, you know, you guys what what I seek out in a cab and in wine in general mm -hmm. out here in California, especially the folks um, who aren't in California. Um, you know, very often wines like this never make it out just because they're too small a production to get into mass distribution mm -hmm. and um, they don't have huge marketing budgets right. to be in your face 24 seven. So, these are the kind of wines that I go hunting every weekend and come and stock up in the cellar. <laughs> and um, it's, it's, I'm super excited to share with you know, all you guys. Thank you for joining on. And the other folks from the Bumgarner, we're all part of the same family from the Bumgarner Club. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a wine bum for life. Sorry, did someone else have something to say? Is this what you guys um, focus on? Is the cabs, are you more of like uh, Juju Pinos? Is this, is cabs your main? So like, we, we actually have a pretty large array of wines. Um, this is what we started out with. When I, when I started making wine, um, I'd been, I've actually been making wine since 1993, but when we started Bumgarner Winery as a commercial endeavor, I'd been making wines for other folks and we, um, we started out with Cabernet as the emphasis. I felt like that was an area that was maybe underrepresented for the quality and availability of really nice mountain grown cabs. And so we started out with that. But soon, we, uh, soon thereafter, we decided to open a tasting room and thought, well, I better have more than one wine on the bar. So um, most of our wines are big reds. You can kind of think of best of, best of Spain, Tempranillo, best of Italy, yeah. Barbera, Sangiovese, yeah. um, best of 
uh, France. France. You know, we Rhone. do Cabernet, yeah. we do Rhones, we do we do two different Rhone blends. One you mentioned earlier is called uh, Fiona, Fiona and yes. L. So we have two different Rhone blends. Uh, we do Petite Syrah. So I'll, you might notice a little bit of a theme. A lot of those are big reds, big, bold, ageable reds. Um, but we also do some delicate, lovely wines. Our Fiona is a Rhone blend that is based on Grenache, usually about 50 to 60% Grenache. That's just delicate, beautiful, very aromatic Syrah, uh, Grenache Syrah Morved. You made it, brother. <laughs> hey, look at him. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, do, we actually do a Pinot. Uh, from the same vineyard, that Duarte vineyard, they have um, 10 different Pinot clones to choose from. And we do Pinot from Duarte vineyard. Uh, what else? Um, we do a lot of whites. At our estate vineyard, we have um, Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc. Viognier. Uh, we do Viognier, we do Friulano. There's, Friulano. So there's quite an array. El Dorado is uh, one of these regions that is, it's... Yeah, it's very prolific, yeah. One of the most diverse regions in California because of our elevation, we're growing grapes from 1,200 feet to about 3,500 feet. So there's a huge range of grapes that we can do well. And so you have relationships with growers and you get different grapes from different elevations and, and it works out really well. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, I know she, uh, she mentioned Pinot. That's perhaps the one varietal that doesn't necessarily thrive that well in this region. There's not a lot of it, for yeah, one, but not a I lot think the, the main reason for that is Pinot is delicate. It's kind of like me, I, I sunburn easily. Um, <laughs> you have to grow it on the north facing slope. So with the diverse uh, topography that we have here, there's lots of north facing slopes, it's particularly on a lot of the river canyons that we have, that if you have a steep you know, uh, high elevation, north slope, and the right clones, you can do a nice Pinot up here. But it's not commonly done because a lot of people don't think of it. You know. Well, I can also see because there are so many other varietals that do so well Absolutely. in the region. Absolutely. Why would you go do Pinot when just, you know, an hour and a half away in yep. Sonoma, in Napa, uh, in Sonoma especially. Oh, they've got, the all, they've got all the conditions that come naturally. They've, they've got, got the maritime the perfect, layer, right. they've got cool yeah. climate. Yeah, or down in the central coast. And so I think, but it, it, neither in the central coast would you find anyone doing a Movedra or a right. Petite Syrah. Well, central, right. central coast, I mean, you go a little, yeah. Se yeah. little east into Paso, you're right. going to get a yes. bunch of that. But. Yes, yeah. I can see that, yes, in Paso, yeah. I guess I was thinking around Santa Barbara there. Um, right, but they're Pino looking more does so Pino well there because you have that marine layer yep. coming in. And, you know, I remember when I was down there, I could see why that climate was just so good for Pinot. Yep. And why the Pinots are so delicious from that region. But if you bring them up here, they just don't thrive on that this rocky granitic. Right. You know, um, it's a whole different landscape and, and sure. a whole different climate for sure. Especially the summers here, they can sometimes be punishing. Yes. And and so you know, Movedra, Syrah, Petit Syrah, you know, Alicante mm -hmm. Boucher, mm -hmm. all of these big bold varietals, the Zinfandel, <laughs> yeah. yeah, would thrive and and express themselves more freely up here. For sure. Um, which uh, and so yeah. That was a long answer. So long answer, varietals, we do, we do many different varietals. Yeah. Um, but. yeah, and I think it's also a way to, to grow because these are all small batches. So Yeah, most of our wines are under 300 cases. Yeah. So, you, you know, you're talking about specific vineyards, you know, sometimes specific blocks within a vineyard. Right. Um, and that's only going to yield you, you know, one to a couple hundred, you know, cases. Yeah. So um, it stands to reason that you would want to, you know, have offer more varietals rather than try to just grow in quantity. A huge, a huge block of one particular varietal. Right. True. And I like that. That's what I like about. I think that's a hallmark of the foothills, really. Yes. You see more diversity, you see more... Uh... 
and it doesn't right. compromise on the quality. I think one thing I find is, you know, once you get past a, you know, a single block and you start, it, 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 it sort of blurs the lines on nuance. Mm -hmm. So I like that. That's what draws me out to, you know, small artisan winemakers as yourself is because I can taste the nuance and it's not diluted across five or ten different vineyards. Right. And, and so a lot of times when I taste these wines, I'm tasting them, not necessarily whether I like them or not, I'm tasting because I want to get a glimpse into what's unique, what's interesting about that and, and, and then that goes back to distribution and why you don't see these wines in the supermarket shops and why they are primarily direct to consumer from the, from the source. So by just virtue of being small production, limited. Yeah, and, and we are literally, I often joke, I say, you know, we're in the golden age of winemaking because wines such as these are just now becoming accessible. Right. You know, direct to consumer model is picking up and is be, there's a little more support of that amidst large um, logistics networks. Um, it's still a challenge, but um, it's better than, you know, five or ten years ago. Of course. And maybe that's a silver lining that's come out of not only just the evolution of, of our distribution model, but yeah. the pandemic, I think. Yeah. You had so many wineries that had to go virtual. Yeah. You had so many wineries that had to uh, address a different model. Um, it accelerated. It did yeah. accelerate. Though. And, and Hi, for me, if I... Yes. Brian, we have a question with Joshua. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, go ahead. Unmute yourself. All right. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. So. Hey, cheers. Hey, you got your wine bum hat on? Oh, you yeah. got the wine bum. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. That's uh, a real wine bum. <laughs> all are amazing wines, but I just had a quick question for actually both of you. Um, of all the varietals that you do pour, what are is your favorite? Um, as far as Bumgarner wines? So I, my, my standard answer would be the wine in my glass, <laughs> but that's, that's not really very informative. Yeah. So um, I would say favorite varietals. I love, I love Cab Franc. I love Cab Sauv. I love uh, a good Tempranillo. Um, they, they tend to be bigger reds, but I tell you, I am getting more and more enamored with my white wine varietals as well. It's interesting. Um, we, we're doing a Bordeaux white. It's a Semillon Sauvignon Blanc blend. That's just phenomenal. And I find myself, you know, I, I come home, I cook dinner, I crack a Sim Sauv, and that is so enjoyable. And it kind of sets you up for the night, you know. And maybe we'll open we'll open a cab after that, or but. I'm an equal opportunity wine lover. In short, I love all wines. So I'm not gonna be like I only drink Pinots, you know. So. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm probably the most biased person because <laughs> I've been I've been chasing his wine since the 05 vintage, and I was just thinking as he was talking, I was thinking about your question, and I think I do have an answer. Um, I love every single one of his wines. It's hard to pick. Um, I think a bunch of them cluster up at the top of my list there. I'm thinking the Fiona, which is a GSM blend. Um, the L's just right under that. Um, I remember one time we had dinner and um, another friend of ours um, got a bottle of Chateau Neuf du Pape. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a well-known GSM um, from France. Um, and we had a side-by-side -side and I felt, you know, his GSM, the Fiona, pulled ahead of that. Um, and that was really good validation. Um, I love the Many Hands. It needs time. The Many Hands, it's, it's an award-winning... It's a board, board, Bordeaux blend. Yeah, yeah. it's an award-winning Bordeaux blend. Um, it needs a lot of time to relax, like most of his wine. Um, I love the cabs, but as good as they are, I mean, the, if you're looking for a singular expression, to explore singular expressions and just understand and kind of just uh, enlightenment of the palate, the Cab Franc really stands out. Um, that needs 
a ton of time <laughs> with these wines, but I'll have they're, to go. They're still super drinkable, but you know, it's they personal. Are. It's a they personal are. It, again, it's more of your palate. You're, you're, you're looking at someone who likes his wines massive and, and very uh, bold, um, but I'll have to give it to his wines that um, drew me in first, and it was a Merlot he made. And um, I think you have a vintage of that coming up. It's been a while. I do, yes. So, it's been a number of years and it's from the same vineyard. That I cannot wait. Yeah, I had uh, 2020, I believe. Yeah. yeah. I, I have all, call all kinds of dibs for that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would say um, Merlot, Cab Franc, um, Cab, uh, Bordeaux blends. Rhone. Rhone, yes. Yeah. Um, Fiona. Fiona is kind of, there's just some about Fiona I like. Yeah. Um, we just bottled the 19s last week. Yeah. Yeah. We did the 19L and the Fiona, so they're just resting. They'll get released probably summertime. Yeah. It's always hard when I'm trying to decide what Bum Garner I'm going, you know, I want to do a look on the blog. <laughs> I come in here and that rack is Bum Garner. That rack back there is Bum Garner. <laughs> And they go back, this case is mostly Bumgarner going back to uh, mid 2000s, I think, or late 2000s. Wow. So, I, <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> That's a, a tough of, question. You got man. a lot of wine in here, though. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and feel free to reach out, you know, on Instagram, or on the blog, or wherever, if, as you're exploring. Let me know what your favorites are. You know, that'll help me decide what to do a look on the blog next. Yeah. <laughs> so. Because my big favorite is always the Petite Syrah. I'm a big Petite Syrah fan. Nice. And we just, I, uh, we just leased a vineyard next door to us. Uh, it's an old vine Petite Syrah vineyard, about two and a half acres. And so we've been, we've been working with that fruit for, this is our, this will be our third vintage from that vineyard. Uh, but yeah, farming it from, from soup to nuts, uh, organically grown and old head trained, gnarly old pizza all vines. It's awesome. <laughs> We, I'm going to interrupt here. We have some amazing petite Syrahs. Our 2018 just scored 92 points in the wine enthusiast. So, um, yeah, I love petite Syrah and we have made, Brian has made some amazing petite Syrahs. I think it, the petite Syrah and the many hands are wines that would be, uh, great options to, to do another vertical in the future. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. The 2012, I think that was the last vintage I took, did a look at. I don't want to The many hands? Yeah, I don't think I even want to open anything younger than that. And it was just phenomenal. So I don't know, I think I shared with you the 2018 just got best of class at the San Francisco Chronicle, second year in a row. And they haven't seen it six years from now. Right, right, <laughs> right. These are two, yeah, these are new looks. Yeah. but. Uh, We've got Lily up again. What? We've got Lily up again. Oh, Raise cool. your hand. Hey, Lily. It's Jeremy, I think. Are we Go. Ready? Hey, I just wanted to say hi. I made it. Yay. Yay. Hey, everybody. <laughs> are, you, are you all caught up on your homework? <laughs> I'm, I'm caught up on my homework, yes. And uh, I, I have to say, I think um, I love the 13 so far the most. Uh. Awesome. Yeah, um, a little, little funky. I, lo I love it. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's uh, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy is one of my biggest wine snobs, along with Roland. <laughs> Roland and Osmer, two of my biggest wine snobs. Those guys, Fantastic. and uh, yeah, they. <laughs> and we go back and forth, and they just love that leathery, especially Loire. Mm -hmm. those, that expression in that oh, yeah. Loire Valley and leathery terroir. And awesome. we've had so many back and forth on chat about, oh, I love the earth, I love the earth. So yeah, super set. keen palettes. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you for sending the 15s. The ladies love the 15s the most, so. Uh... Oh, I'm glad it made it in time. Yeah. It was it's so good. good. <laughs> There's a little bum garner in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the youngest bum garner. This is the fifth in line. This is Jacob. So I'm going to stand on his tippy toes. We only see his eyes. I'll adjust the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> what was 
say hi? Hi. Yeah. I remember at the bottling last fall, he was hustling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We all get involved. We've got our own bottling crew. Yeah. <laughs> Five little bum grinders. Not so little anymore. So, um... Uh, Jeremy, what, uh, so you have the 13, and what do you think of the 17 and 15? So the, the, I like them all. I think that the 15 is, it's got a lot more fruit for me. Um, I like the 13, you know me, I love that the, yep. the secondary flavors are actually primary. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's coming on the 13. The 15 is a little more fruit. The 17, I can, t I feel like I need to give it a few years. So I'm glad I've got a few more bottles because I'm like, yep. <laughs> I, I, I think I want to try this one again in three, four years. Um, I, I can tell it's really good. It's it's a lot of, uh, you get a lot of pepper and spice out of that one. Yep. Like. <laughs> How about you, Samantha? Uh, definitely the 15 for me. I, I well, I do like a, little bit of thumb to my wine the fruit the fruit forward yep. is definitely my yep. my uh my preference so the 15 to me is perfection super good awesome. nice yeah Very she nice. likes that crisp that crisp fruit mm -hmm. um yeah, um, and Mrs. Uh, we. I, by the way, I was the one who uh, gave gave you guys a nickname, Mr. and Mrs. Bogey. So <laughs> we do love the Bogey. It's so yeah. Good. So it's, it's another wine of our winemaker of the year. For, okay. Um, 2020, but yeah, he, um, he has this Pinot. He has this crisp fruit. Rosser. Yes, the yeah. Rosser. He has yeah, this yeah. crisp fruit, and so I can see. I can now see how. Yeah, he, her palate he would get to know it. Yeah. Then. <laughs> yeah, awesome. exactly. We may or may not have started with a blind finder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm not supposed to tell secrets. How else would you start? <laughs> Anyone else have any thoughts they want to share? I saw I saw some big parties there. I know you guys you guys are getting into something on Friday. <laughs> I have to say it was really fun to see groups of people together gathering yeah. and, and eating and sharing wine and sharing your evening with us. It was really, really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all and thank you, Brian. We're sharing great wine. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, this this has definitely been a treat. This is my first uh, time doing one of these. Um, so, I mean, thank you, uh, Jennifer and Brian Bumgarner. It's been a pleasure. Um, you know, Dave, you know, Brian and Bumgarner Winery um, are the winemaker of the year for winesnob.blog. And it's, <laughs> um, I've been following his wines all these years. And I couldn't, I, it's something I really wanted to share. And the idea behind the winemaker of the year was to highlight all the winemakers that I've found going out off the beaten path, spending, racking up many miles, digging out all these people hiding in, you know, you know, literally in the hills um, and finding these hidden gems. And it's, it's a pleasure to share with you folks. Um, and I hope to share more opportunities like this. You don't have to twist my arm if you want to just you know, do a live on Instagram or anything. If it's Friday and you're opening some wine and you just want to geek out on wine, just feel free to connect, um, get in touch. And if you would like to see more um, opportunities like this, definitely let us know, let Jennifer know, let Brian know, let me know. We'll find creative ways to put it together. Maybe we'll revisit some wines we talked about today and, and you know, go down that path as well. Um, maybe we'll talk about other interesting wines that have an interesting history or significance, mm -hmm. um, you know, over time. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you guys and all the friends who came today. <laughs> um, that was awesome. That, that's exactly how my place looks <laughs> on a Friday night. Right on. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. So the place where Brian, is that is that your personal wine cellar or? This is this is Brian's lair. This yes, wow. sir. This is the lair. Yeah. 
Wow. It's awesome. Aye. It's awesome. There's got to be 500, 600 bottles in here. How many am I off How by many, a couple uh, hundred? How many bottles about, are in there? About 1,600, yes. 1,600? I was off by 1,000. Jeez. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of wine in here, guys. I have That's wine awesome. issues. I just, I, I just come out and admit it. I have wine issues. My, my imaginary wife and I have many quarrels. <laughs> yes, sir. And it's, it's, it's not so much. I don't believe that. Um, I mean, when you go because of media and marketing, there's a tendency to always find pomp, prestige, and expensive people collect wine like trophies. I don't do that. I collect wine because it's tr it truly is rare. So uh, I have vintages here that he's made and other winemakers such as himself that have found over the years that literally no one knows about. But they make these amazing wines that will stand by themselves any day. Um, and so that's what the cellar is full of. Um, some people collect um, canvas on a wall. Mm -hmm. I collect wine on the rack. And, and I like to open it with my friends. Some people ask, how are you going to drink all this? And it's like, they don't get it. I'm not drinking all this. I'm enjoying it with, with friends, friends yeah. and folks out there. And I started, I started winesnob.blog to open my cellar to the world and find other wine enthusiasts um, like, like you guys um, that want to taste unique things. You know, Jeremy and Roland, I remember we go back and forth in Osmer. We go back and forth a lot because, and they've brought a lot of other wines to my attention too. So it's really interesting. I love digging around and finding these hidden gems. Um, There's a lot of beautiful wines out there. So, yeah, <laughs> my wine issues. <laughs> if you're ever in Sacramento, um, hit me up. <laughs> What's that? Oh, there you go. Yeah, if, if you're in Sacramento, hit me up. Um, yeah, come on by, open some wine, man. Yeah. Just hit me up. Hit me up on IG, on the, you know, wherever, and uh, we'll make it happen, man. Bring, bring a bottle of some good you like, yeah. and uh, yeah, we'll talk, we'll, we'll geek out on wine. What better way to spend, you know, an evening? That's <laughs> oh, beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm super, super grateful. Shout out to uh, Brian and Jennifer for supporting my passion. Um, you know, I just love putting this content out there. Um, it's, it's not sponsored in any way. I just think like really good stuff should be shared and put out there and is designed to reach out to other folks like myself, such as you. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I All right. It. Any any last questions before we sign off for the evening? Anybody have any comments? VX Robinson's. Oh, we've got Roland. Go ahead, Roland. Well, thank you for getting our wines for us. It was great. They came in on time. And, Yay! <laughs> and I'm so glad we got to participate and looking forward to going up there and visiting the winery soon. Well, thank you. Um, we look yeah. forward to, to seeing you. Yeah. yeah. So thank Again. you. Thank you. And I'll be taking you guys up there myself. <laughs> Wonderful. I can't wait. That'll be great. All right, everybody. Well, thank you all so very much. We we always I always get nervous doing these things, but I enjoy it so much once I see everybody, and it's it's just wonderful. It's really it's been a silver lining coming out of COVID. Uh, this format, I don't know. It's it's nice to connect with people and and so many people from so many different places all around. So thank you all for sharing your evening with us. Brian and Brian, any, any final words to sign off? Well, I just wanted to thank all of you, all of you that have attended tonight, um, enjoyed the conversation and look forward to having you visit us if, if at all possible at some time soon. We'd love to meet you in person. Uh, cheers. And, cheers. Uh, Rich, did you want to say something? Yeah. I think Rich might want to say something. No, I just wanted to thank everybody. It was a great night. Yeah, we enjoyed it. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, Rich. Thank, thank you. Rich. Um, Bye, Paula. Yeah, just Hi, Paula, I just wanted Leanne. to. Hi, <laughs> I just I just wanted to add if if you have any questions while you're thinking about it, while you're enjoying the rest of your wines, um, feel free to reach out. 
If you'd like to see content about more specific things, I'm always looking for ideas of, you know, uh, to go bug Brian, grab my camera, go up the hill and bug Brian in the vineyard. <laughs> so um, feel free to shout out, connect with me on winesnob.blog or on Instagram as well, or anywhere you like on YouTube. There's a segment, I posted a segment I did with Brian. It's a great way to get to know his story. Um, it's on YouTube, just um, search for Wine Snob and you should see the wine logo and you're good to go. But thank you again to everyone. Um, I appreciate you guys. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Brian. This has been a real treat um, for a wine enthusiast. So thank you. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers everyone. Cheers. <laughs> good night. Happy Friday. <laughs> Happy Friday, thank you. Happy Friday. Cheers.